is a battle most parents face this day and age, getting their kids away from video games. So what do you think of this policy? Last month, China instituted a rule limiting teenagers to no more than three hours a week spent on online gaming. So that's not something that's likely to happen here in our country. But Denver 7's Nicole Brady is here. And Nicole, you're taking a 360 look at who should set the limits and is spending more than three hours a week on gaming really so bad? <laughs> you know, some parents in China said they actually really like this new rule because it takes the pressure off of them to set limits. As a parent, I can relate to that. But doing this story, I learned it's not necessarily just about the number of hours you play. We also have to think about the type of game, why the kids are playing, who they're playing with. And it may be time to acknowledge that the world of online gaming is changing a lot. Oh no, I've already gotten circled. I'm trapped. A friendly competition. For me, it's really the social aspect, getting on with your friends and having a good time. It, oh, let's go. Oh, we got one, we got one. Multiplayer is pretty much everything. Our Discord server for this campus has 3,000 people in it. Video games have always been popular on college campuses for recreation, and now organized eSports leagues are gaining more official status. Um, our eSports teams, you know, are really about providing an opportunity for our students to compete and represent the school. You get to travel, you get to play. Um, and, and really showcase their skills kind of on a national scale. But gamers know there can be a dark side. Gaming addiction is a problem. Not long ago, Nick Rempel was playing six or seven hours a day. It caught up with him. I failed calculus two twice because of gaming. It is scary how addictive games can be. It's so fun, it's such a different world, it's such an escape but you do have to eventually come back down to reality. So how do you find that balance? China thinks it has the answer. The country is now limiting teenagers to three hours of online gaming per week. They can only play between 8 and 9 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. We took our questions about these draconian restrictions to experts in Colorado. Clinical psychologist Nicole Cross did her dissertation on online gaming addiction. We have endogenous chemicals that our brain releases when we're doing certain activities that are highly, highly rewarding. There are signs when someone is truly addicted to playing these games. It's um, withdrawal, tolerance, preoccupation continuing use despite risks and despite losses. She says someone in that state wouldn't likely be able to set their own limits. Part of why I think that it, it might be fair for a government to sort of have a say in this is because there are a lot of gaming companies who, in my personal opinion, and perhaps professional opinion, are not being very responsible about the ways that they structure their games. Not everyone agrees, though. I'm hesitant to say that companies should step in in that way or that the government should step in in that way. I do really think it's the parents' responsibility. Bethany Fleck Dillon, an MSU Denver professor and parenting and family expert, knows how hard it is for parents to set limits when it comes to kids and any screen time. But in a world where games Gaming is only growing. That's what it may come down to. Limit setting is our job as parents. We have to socialize our children so that they are healthy and they um, grow up and, and do the things that are beneficial for themselves and society. One thing both of these experts do agree on is that the content of the game matters. A game like Minecraft that uses problem solving and has no reward system can actually be educational. But it goes beyond just good and bad games. Online gaming is being used in ways most of us never imagined. Uh, there are people who are modifying games, who are, who are creating content that is reflective of who they are as a person. Last year, during the George Floyd protests, players of the controversial game Grand Theft Auto Online staged an in-game virtual protest. Young people got together. There were like 30 or 60 of them in this uh, online server. And they said, you know what? Today, we're not killing each other. We're not killing cops. We are protesting. Arturo Cortez leads a project at CU Boulder called LIT, the Learning to Transform Video Games Laboratory. He says a growing number of players are pushing back on the toxic aspects of gaming culture and expanding the possibilities for communities of color and LGBTQ+. What's really intriguing to me about video game play is that people not only are reimagining who they are as a citizen, but they're reimagining what kind of society they want. Do we want to limit that? Do we want to limit the, the dreaming, the, the imagination that emerges in these spaces? 
especially when it comes to building with people in online multiplayer gaming environments. It's getting crazy over here. That social aspect of gaming is really what it comes back to for Nick and Josh. Gaming bringing opportunities for college experiences and career paths that never existed before. There's a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities as well. Um, since it's a growing industry, there's a lot of startups. So they'll likely continue playing games for well over three hours a week. <laughs> And one more note on the economic uh, perspective of this. A study by CenturyLink recently found the average salary for a professional gamer is just under $49,000 a year. That's not even the really popular ones who are making millions from having fans watching them game online. We want to hear from you. What do you think of the three-hour-per-week gaming limit, and how are you navigating this issue with your family? Email us at 360 at thedenverchannel.com. Yeah, I'm curious to what people have to say. Thank you, Nicole.